Hello, my friends and followers. I'm so glad you're back. And today I have a special for you because I'm right here beautifully outside with the skyline of Frankfurt actually being to my right, as you can see. And as the summer starts, uh, I'm so excited to introduce you to a new book study series that we're going to do probably longer than just the summer because the, the book, um, if I put a video out every week, it's going to take us a while to get through it. So I want to introduce the book. It's The Imitation of Christ. And we're going to read the foreword so you just know just a little bit about the author and what it is a little bit about. And then we're going to go in the chapter. Today I'm going to not only read you the preface, but also the first chapter and then talk to you a little bit about it. So let's get started. Forward. In preparing this edition of The Imitation of Christ, the aim was to achieve a simple, readable text which would ring true to those who are already lovers of this incomparable book and would attract others to it. For this reason, we have attempted to render the text into English as it is spoken today rather than cloudy, archaic terminology that encumbers so many translations of Christian classics. The results we feel has achieved a directness and consciousness which will meet the approval of modern readers. In the second place, we have made use of the familiar paragraph form, doing away with a simple statement or verse from the original and of many translations. This was done in the interest of easier reading in order to bring out more clearly the connection between the single statements. No claim of literary excellence over the many English versions now extant is here advanced, nor any attempt to solve in further confusion the problem of the book's authorship. Theories most popular at the moment ascribe the imitation to two or three men, members of the Brethren of the Common Life, an association of priests organized in the Netherlands in the later half of the 14th century. That Thomas Hermican of Kempen, or Thomas a Kempis, as he's now known, later translated a composite of the writings, essentially a spiritual diary from the original Le Netherlandish into Latin, is generally admitted by scholars. This Thomas, born about the year 1380, was educated by the Brethren of the Common Life was moved to join the community and was ordained priest. His career thereafter was devoted to practicing the counsels of spiritual perfection and to copying books for the schools. From both pursuits involved the imitation of Christ. As editor and translator, he was not without faults, but thanks to him, the imitation became and has remained after the Bible, the most widely read book in the world. It is in this edition that is here rendered into English without deletion of chapters or parts of them because doubts exist as to their authorship or because of variations in style or for any of the other more or less valid reasons. There is but one major change. This treatise on Holy Communion, which Kempis places a book three, is here entitled book four, the moves make the order of the whole more magical, logical, and agrees with the thought of most editors. So let's get into the first chapter. Book one. Thoughts helpful in the life of the soul. Imitating Christ and despising all vanities on earth. He who follows me walks not in darkness, says the Lord. By these words of Christ, we are advised to imitate his life and habits if we wish to be truly enlightened and free from all blindness of heart. Let our chief effort, therefore, be to study the life of Jesus Christ. 
The teaching of Christ is more excellent than all the advice of the saints, and he who has his spirit will find it in a hidden strength. Now there are many who hear the gospel often, but care little for it, because they have not the spirit of Christ. Yet whoever wishes to understand fully the words of Christ must try to pattern his whole life on that of Christ. What good does it do to speak learnedly about the Trinity if, lacking humility, you displease the Trinity? Indeed, it is not learning that makes a man holy or just, but a virtuous life makes him pleasing to God. I rather feel contrition than both how to define it. For what would it profit us to know the whole Bible by heart and the principles of all the philosophers if we live without grace and the love of God? Vanity of vanities, and all is vanity except to love God and to serve Him alone. This is the greatest wisdom, to seek the kingdom of heaven through contempt of the world. It is vanity, therefore, to seek and trust in riches that perish. It is vanity also to court honor and to be puffed up with pride. It is vanity to follow the lusts of the body and to desire things for which their punishment later must come. It is vanity to wish for a long life or to care little about a well-spent life. It is vanity to be concerned with the present only and not to make provisions for things to come. It is vanity to love what passes quickly and not to look ahead where eternal joy abides. Often we call that proverb, the eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing. Try moreover to turn your heart from the love of the things visible and bring yourself to things invisible. For they who follow their own evil passions stain their consciousness and lose the grace of God. So this was chapter one, and I think it was pretty straightforward to say that everything in life, what you aim for, what you make the center of your life might be vanity. It might be trying to grasp the wind because once you die, you will lose everything. And then where will you go then? Have you gained treasures that bring you to heaven? And not only barely, but truly bring you to heaven with treasures? You see, our life here determines the life that, that comes after this life where we will go and how we will live in riches and treasures or in poorness this is determined by how you live your life now so if you make god the center of your life and look beyond the physical appearances of life like i always tell you to look beyond my feet and see god in them See the connection that you can find beyond your physical senses. Then you can find God and place him in the center of your life. And then you will gain eternal treasures. Because this is really what this life is about. I hope I see you next week for another continual reading of the Imitation of Christ. I see you then.